she did an awesome job today. Give her a hand and a great stand. And uh, my wife and I started helping out my parents uh, in their ministry last year. Um, as Pastor Bob said, I was a music director for in the Detroit area for about 15 years. And I um, uh, loved it. I uh, had a great time there and uh, kind of grew up there. And so uh, God kind of tugged at our hearts and then we realized that uh, there was something that he wanted us to do. Uh, outside of what we were doing. So um, I've been back to Congo three times. I have uh, just got back last June, had a great time, have just really enjoyed the work. It's a totally different, fresh thing. And um, I kind of like that. I kind of like getting new challenges and different things like that. So um, my wife is with me today. Uh, I couldn't, uh, we didn't bring the kids, but we could have. We just chose not to. So we wanted to make it like a date, a date thing. You know, so uh, I have my wife, Molly, I do stand and uh, say hello. My beautiful wife, Molly. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Like, how did that end up with that? Uh, I really don't know. But we're going to talk about it. It's called Grace. Um, and so we're going to chat about that. But I have just a real quick announcement. I have stuff I want to give away. All right? I'm, I'm not looking to get from you today. I'm looking to give. This is the bald one. This is the group Salem. The bald headed guy, that's my brother. I like to reiterate that he's the bald one. Okay, so I, I kind of like that. Um, he he uh, leads in the group Sela, and I have CDs of their new album, uh, their most recent album, Out the Lobby, and I have a prayer card. And what I'd like you to do, if you feel led and compelled, you want to know more about the ministry or just want to pray for us, um, we have a vision of developing a team of 10,000 people that would be praying for the church in Congo every day. Um, eventually, I'd like to see someone fasting for the ministry in Congo, one person every day out of the whole year. Wouldn't that be cool? I think that would do some pretty cool things. And so if that's something you kind of feel uh, might be drawn to or want more information about, the team is called Team Oxygen. And its mission is just to breathe life into the Church of Congo. Let God's light kind of come in. Uh, the problems there are, are pretty challenging, and they can't be fixed with money. Uh, we have the need of resources, of course, but what we really see is God needing to breathe life into uh, people. And that's what God does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so um, if you sign up for that, I want to give you a CD. And um, and what you can do is just, it's really convenient. You can take this home and just kind of keep it on your fridge as a reminder to pray for the ministry. Um, it tells a little bit of our story in the back. If you want to find out more, we'll get a monthly uh, prayer letter that will kind of just tell you what we're, what we're what the challenges are. And uh, we'd love to have you sign up if you're interested and take a CD or two. Well, Dad, if you took one already, going on. You don't have to go sign up now. If you took one, it's fine. Uh, not a big deal. But um, I am so excited to be here with you guys. This is my first time preaching here. And um, last time I came here, I just love the spirit of the place. I think you guys are on a great track. And uh, I'm excited to see what's happening in the future. And uh, change is always interesting. And when you're doing stuff in the local church, that can always be a little bit of a, how are we going to dance? And what are we going to do here? And so God's got it all under control. And I am so excited to see what God does with Oakwood and the believers here. And so if you would, open your Bibles to a, to a strange chapter. Second Chronicles, chapter 33. We're going to read about a guy uh, who's a king. Second Chronicles is a great book. For um, if you want to kind of study what not to do, it's a great book. Um, if you're in positions of leadership, if you're in management, if you're trying to um, uh, develop those skill sets, it's a great book to read and reread. I, I, I oftentimes go back to it because it really kind of helps you focus on what you need to focus on. So Second Chronicles comes after. Yeah, 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 and you're sharp. That's right. First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, it's in the Old Testament. Um, and I couldn't tell you what the, what's the book before First Chronicles. What is it? Kings. Kings. What is it? Second Kings. Very good. Good job. All right. So it talks about the kings, and that's where we're going to be today. Second, Second Chronicles chapter 33. And if you would, would you bow with me? And let's pray and ask God to bless his word to us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the grace you've given and God as, as Libby led and, and as we sang, God, we need you. We need you desperately. And Jesus, part of our need is not even knowing how desperate we are for you. And unless you unlock that, and unless you breathe that reality into us, God, we'll be fighting you and not even know it. So Lord, I'm asking that every believer in here, that your spirit, uh, 
would be welcomed in this place, that you would touch them deeply and in a meaningful way. And God, that we would walk out of here just having done church and checking the list, but Lord, that you would please enable us to experience your presence in a real and a significant way. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, my wife and I are kind of transitioning. We're going through a bit of a, of a uh, uh, culture shock. You know, we, we moved from Michigan to Tennessee, and, and I kind of want to just give you a story about this culture shock we're going through. We, um, we bought this house, had a bunch of landscaping. The folks trying to sell it had already moved out, and they were gone for about six, seven months, so the overgrowth was pretty rough. And so we started ripping these things out. I'm from downriver, south of Detroit, so I had no hesitation of hitting my truck on the grass and yanking stuff out and uh, having the vehicle all over the place and just kind of pulling stuff. And so I pulled it all up to the curb. My neighbors started getting a little nervous, you know, like I wasn't going to take care of it or anything, you know, because I was new, they didn't know who I was. So they said, no, the county will come and get that stuff. I said, oh, that's really neat. And they go, yeah, I'll come get it, and it'll be free. I said, you're kidding. Free, like, landscaping, you know, kind of services. And so uh, I thought that was awesome. So I called this number. Sure enough, the guy said, yeah, we'll be out there in a few days. So it's early morning one day. Uh, a couple days later, sure enough, this car pulls up, and it's really loud, and it's the chipper, you know, and they get the, all the brush, and they put it through the, the wood chipper, and they drive it away, you know. So I could hear this thing, and I thought, oh, that group, that group's here. So um, I go ahead and I open my front door to walk out, got my head down, I look up and I just kind of stop. And I, it took me a minute because this is what I saw when I, uh, when I opened my front door. Is that there, that first page? First page? It's coming. <laughs> that was the free landscape. I got another image of it. If you look at the next picture. So, Murray County Highway Prisoner Work Crew. And so I took a picture of this. And I went into my bedroom because Molly was still laying down. I said, honey, the landscaping crew's here. <laughs> and I showed it to her. She said, that's the landscaping crew. And I went back outside and I just started to have ball. I got to talk to the guys, they were really cool. And I talked to the guy who had the gun and kind of stood really close to him. <laughs> and I got to talk to him and everything and I got to watch my neighbors drive by. Oh, it was wonderful. It's dark. I got a dark side so when I see that happening, my neighbors are driving by really nervous, kind of, kind of making sure they got their wallets and they're driving by like, what's going on? And so we had a great time with these guys. Those guys did an outstanding job and uh, we, we were so, uh, we were so excited to kind of um, uh, get to interact uh, with the, the guy that was in charge who was really neat and so that was kind of a fun story. So that's kind of some of the culture shock that we're going through in Tennessee. It's just a little different down there. I guess chain gang aren't over. I didn't know it. Uh, we don't have those up here. This, I was in Michigan. So uh, that was kind of a different thing. But today I want to kind of get into uh, the subject of what we're going to be talking about. And um, I'm just going to try and tell my story of what God's done in my life, and I hopefully it'll resonate with you. So if we go to that, that next slide, um, we're going to talk about this theme called being at war with grace. Being at war with grace. So if you got a pen, you want to jot some stuff down, go ahead and do that. It's kind of an odd title. We're going to discover um, why we're kind of going to have to think about this concept a little bit. I think it's really important for the church to consider. And so this at war with grace is um, the grace of God. The favor that he shows in you. But before we kind of get into it, um, one of the things I wanted to kind of explain is that uh, as believers, we often kind of like celebrate grace, but oftentimes I wonder if we really know what we're celebrating, right? Like we sing about amazing grace. I heard about it since I was a little kid, about God's grace, and I thought I had a good grasp on it, but I, I'm really starting to wonder if, if we need to really kind of brand it and, and rediscover what grace really means. And so what I want to kind of share with you is uh, kind of the definition in the Bible of what grace is. The, the biblical definition, or the believer's definition of it, is undeserved favor. We have that as undeserved favor. So basically what that means is, is uh, someone is showing you kindness that you don't what? And so what's the key of that, those two words, undeserved favor? The key is the, is the noun or the adjective? Adjective. Right? 
It's the adjective. Why? Because you're receiving favor, but it's telling you a specific kind of favor. So when you go into work, and you do your job, and you get that paycheck, you're being shown favor, I guess. But is it deserved or undeserved? Deserved, right? You put in your work, you put in your labor, and you got this compensation. But when you come against this concept in the Bible, it's completely different. It's called undeserved favor. And so that's really important. Another way of looking at it, the closest worldly definition we can think of is really this word called luck. Can you deserve luck? If someone goes and plays the lotto, which I'm not condoning to do that, but if you go and play the lotto or someone goes and plays the lotto and they give you their ticket, their winning ticket, they win $500,000. Okay, and they give you the proceeds of that ticket. Did you earn those proceeds? Did you earn them? No. Someone just felt like giving it to you. It was a gift. And you just kind of got lucky. Now, we don't often think of grace like that, but that's really what the Bible's saying. That when you become a believer and you give your life to Jesus because of what he's done for you, you do that because you're so overwhelmed by how lucky you are that he gave his life for every single one of us. That's what's supposed to compel us. Now, the opposite of that is what I oftentimes have in my life, what I oftentimes see in churches, which is what? People feel obligated. I gotta read my Bible. I gotta pray. I gotta go to church. Right? We can all name them, can't we? We can all kind of just go through the list of, yeah, these are my obligations. When you and I approach God like that, it has nothing to do with grace. We've lost the whole attitude behind it. Because it's a have to. I talk to my kids about this all the time. You're going to have to decide as a person in your attitude and mindset if you're going to approach life with an attitude of have to or get to. So if you're raising your kids and we're dragging them to church and that attitude behind of why you go is because we ought to, should to, have to, chances are one day they're going to go, but I don't want to. When that day comes, we're going to have a little crisis. we got to want this. If we don't want it, how in the world are we going to be able to draw the people? And that's what grace does. Grace is this whole, it's kind of like uh, when you watch a movie and you have the soundtrack playing in the background and there's a suspenseful part and they got very crazy music, you know, very scary music. And then you have this wonderful theme playing in the background that opens up into a field and it's just beautiful and majestic. You have this wonderful music that matches it. If you didn't have that music in the background, even though your eyes are fixed on the image, that music in the background is what also brings you into it and real, makes you realize, wow, this is, this is a beautiful thing I've seen or this is a scary thing that I've seen. It's, that soundtrack behind those images is kind of what grace is. It's an attitude. So I look at my marriage through the eyes of grace. I look at my children through the eyes of grace, undeserved favor. Or I look at my marriage and my boss and my work, my responsibilities, and driving the kids here, driving the kids there, as I've got to do this. And pretty soon what we find out is we're just kind of letting the life run us. And you don't quite feel like you're, like you're enjoying it. How do you know exactly what I'm talking about? Come on, be honest. Okay, and the rest of you will pray for you because you're, you know, you know. We've all felt that. And so there's dangers of not knowing what grace is all about. I meet a lot of Christians. Let me ask you this. This is rhetorical. You don't have to answer it. When you meet Christians, which ones do you want to be around? The ones that when you get around them, they kind of just have a spark and welcome you and feel like your life is lucky and they're excited. Remember like when you were a new believer? Or do you like kind of being with the guys in the background who it's been a long time since they felt that spark? Who are we drawn to more? Yeah. The ones who know about grace. The ones who feel it deep in their heart. And I'm afraid we know it here in our head. And we might be full of theology, but we kind of, we kind of are missing stuff here in the heart. Christianity and the faith we have in Jesus wants things to go deep. So let's take a look at this guy. He's in 2 Chronicles 33. And I'm just going to start reading. And um, we'll kind of go through it. The first point that I want you to look at is the dangers of ignored grace. So this is what happens, what potentially can happen in your life when you've been shown this favor. And all of us have, because why? We woke up this morning. 
No one deserved to wake up. God decided to just put air in our lungs. We didn't do anything to make sure our heart breathed through the night. Our, our lungs breathed through the night. Our heart breathed through the night. We just woke up, kind of living our life. And if we live like that, we can kind of start to ignore things. So the dangers of ignored grace. It says um, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He was Hezekiah's boy. Hezekiah was a great king. He was a godly man. Verse 2, it says, He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nation that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. Um, Manasseh even took a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple, the very place where God had told David and his son Solomon, My name will be honored here forever. Am I in order here? You guys following me? Okay, hold on. Let me back up here. Okay, let me see. I'm sorry. Here we go. Verse 3. Here we go. He rebuilt the pagan shrines his father Hezekiah had broken down, the good king, the godly king. He constructed altars for the images of Baal and set up a share of poles. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. Obviously, that's excluding God. He goes on, he says, He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord, the place where the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens and both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also goes on, sacrificed his own sons in the fire of the valley of ben -Hanan. He practiced sorcery, divination, witchcraft. He consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even took up a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple, the very place where God had told David and his son Solomon, My name will be honored forever in this temple in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. If the Israelites would be careful to obey my commands, all the laws, decrees, regulations given through Moses, I will not send them into exile from this land that I set aside for your ancestors. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. So back when Joshua was leading the people through, they kind of pushed out the evil that was going on. By the time it reaches um, Manasseh's kingship, he's making the country worse than when it was even occupied by the Israelites. They've gone way back. I mean, just lost all this ground in the people's lives. But God spoke to Manasseh and his people about this. They ignored him. Dangers of ignored grace. Ready? First thing I want you to see, the dangers of ignored grace is that a godly heritage can be a double weakness. And boy, do I know about this one. A godly heritage can be a double weakness. Here's what this means. I am a third generation missionary kid. My grandpa went out to Congo in 1938. My dad was born out there in 1942. I was born out there in 1979. I grew up with missionary parents. I grew up going to churches. I grew up hearing about God so much that it almost became like static. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, the grace that God had showed me, I didn't have eyes to see it anymore. And this is exactly what Manasseh is dealing with. He's got a godly daddy who died when he was 12. He set up the he set up the kingdom the right way. He was honoring God with his life, and all of a sudden, this young man steps into this role and just completely ruins it, decimates all that progress that was made because he took his godly heritage for granted, and he just assumed that it was going to be okay. He didn't know the value of it. And this is a message I really want you young people, younger folks, to, to hear. You know, you're going through your life, you got your 12, 13, 15, and you're going on to your 20s. Those decisions that you're making, your faith in Jesus is not going to be grasped by osmosis. Parents, we need to teach our kids that just because you've chosen to follow Jesus does not guarantee that your kids and your grandkids are going to follow Jesus. It doesn't happen by accident. And just because you've made progress doesn't mean that enemy can't come in the second generation from when you're at and just rob it all and take it back. And that's exactly what happened with Manasseh. All that labor that Hezekiah did, all the wall building that Hezekiah did, all the purging and cleansing was wiped away. Why? Because Manasseh just took it for granted. He just thought, God bless my dad, God will bless me, it'll be fine. I don't even think I need to think about it. 
And if we're not careful, we're going to run the same trip. That's what I struggled with. I heard the story, I heard it over and over again, but it wasn't impacting me here. Now, I could lead someone to Jesus when I was a little boy. Because I knew the story that well. But in my heart, it hadn't captured me yet. It took a long time. And everybody has to walk this path alone. Just because I've done it, my kids aren't necessarily going to be bound to do it either. So that's one of the dangers of ignored grace. We're just, we're, we're going to take it for granted. And having that down the air just could be a double weakness. The second thing I want us to see is that every blessing when you're ignoring grace is really a liability. Everything that God wants to do with your life, and he wants to do incredible things with our lives, and wonderful things, but if we ignore grace, if we don't have this relationship with God's favor, where it's almost like an electricity inside of us, if that isn't present and real, then every blessing he potentially gives us can become an undermining thing. Because we're not ready to receive it. We don't know the value of it. We don't know the means of it. You've heard these stories of people going to garage sales, buying these old paintings, and they were, they were selling for three bucks or five bucks. It turns out they were Monet, Van Gogh. They open up the back of it, people have found the Declaration of Independence, an original copy, because they were just looking at the outward and they are going, what's the point of this? Discarding it. And so, you don't see the value of grace sometimes. You don't see the value, it's just like that with us. The things we read about in the Bible, unless they become real to you and to me, not to Pastor Don, only, but to each of us, we're going to be missing the whole thing. And the blessings that God wants to do will actually become things that undermine us. Finally, the last danger of ignore grace is I want us to see that inward corruption precedes outward sin. Something was wrong with this young man, Manasseh. At an early age, he started to give his part away to the wrong things. But don't mistake the fact that it was something inside that was off. Not the fact that he built temples. Not the fact that he sacrificed his sons. Those are terrible things, but those were only symptoms. What was the root of Manasseh's problem? His heart didn't beat for God. And as a result, his hands, the outward life that he formed, was, was horrifying. It was terrible. So just because we've, we've got some things in the outward as parents, we don't want to teach our kids behavior modification. You don't want to teach your kids you, you go to church because you should. You want to teach our kids that you're going to have to decide one day, but I want to display to my children that it's real. If they see that I'm not perfect, but man, I want to follow Jesus because of what he's done for my life. It's very, very compelling, but very different than what we find in most religions, which is obligatory. But there's a great thing that happens in this story. The second point I wanted to point out is the long arms of grace. This is when the story starts to get good. God is an incredible story writer. He writes these stories and you just, no man, when you read the Bible, you, you, you have this sense that the stories are true because they're just kind of weird enough to be true. But at the same time, no one could write it. No man could come up with these stories. So this is what happens in Manasseh. God's disgusted. They're ignoring his grace. They're, he's trying to talk through sense to him, and they're blowing him off. And so here's what happens in the story. It says, Then God directed the leaders of the troops of the king of Assyria to come after Manasseh. And they got him. They put a hook in his nose, shackles on his feet, and took him off the battle. Now that he was in trouble, he went to his knees in prayer, asking for help. And he had a total repentance before the God of his ancestors. So what did he do to get that change? Did he do anything? Yes and no. He wasn't the king anymore. He couldn't do any good. He couldn't make life happen. He couldn't get set free by himself. But he said he had a total repentance, the Bible says. What does that mean? Everything changed where? Oh, man, he was not the same guy. If you'd have met Manasseh, now, at this season in his life, he'd have told you about how, how much regret he had for what he's done. He'd have probably told you in tears, I can't believe I threw it all away. I blew it. And your heart would feel his pain because he's had this total transformation. He's not ignoring grace anymore. He's becoming alive to it. He's getting eyes for it. He's getting ears for it. It goes on to say, 
Total repentance before the God of his ancestors. And as he prayed, God was touched. God listened and brought him back to Jerusalem as king. That convinced Manasseh that God was the Lord. You know what I love about God? Say he loves to give you and I second chances. Oh man, I have blown it so many times. And God never stops. If I will just humble myself, he never stops creating a door to get a second chance. And I don't, I don't know if that resonates with you, but if you've done something bad in your life, you've done something wrong that you're carrying today, I don't think any of you have sacrificed your kids. I don't think any of you have walked into a church building, totally desecrated the place, set up new idols to false gods, and lost everything because of it. But here's the truth. No matter what you've done, God will build a road of deliverance. That might be painful, it might be hurtful. He will make a way for you to come back. And it breaks my heart to see how many believers are standing on a fringe of this faith because of yesterday. Because of what they're carrying. God says, oh, I'll change all that. Fix it all. I'll make it right. Because he's the God who gives second chances. And he puts them back in power. Back in authority. So I want you to see my first point today under this, this idea is that grace grows in dark places. <laughs> Grace goes in dark places. And if the, if the lights seem to be coming down in your life, if the light of your life is starting to dim, and you're starting to feel like, I just don't know if this marriage is worth it. I don't know if, if our kids are going to follow God and have a heart for Him. And I feel hopeless. You might be entering a season of real, transforming grace in your life. But God is ready to break through to do something you can't even imagine. But some of us are so beaten down by the enemy and he's got his boot in our throat so much we just can't even bring ourselves to hope for it. Hope for it, church. Hope for it. Because it's not in my strength or yours. It's in God's. God puts him back. Grace grows in dark places. You ever, you ever been asleep at night and you hear a noise, you want to get up and walk out, and the hallway lights on, but your door is shut in your bedroom. You have no lights on. And you don't want to turn your light on, obviously, because you'll disturb your spouse. And and you know the rule, the guy's going to check the noise, right? So the guy's got to get up and he's got to walk out and he's got to do it also discreetly, right? Like a ninja, very quietly. <laughs> That's his obligation. It's part of the marriage deed. It's in the Bible somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> Oftentimes I'll get up and I'll hear a noise. My will say, I heard a noise. Go check on it. And uh, usually it's not even that many words. It's just noise. Go. <laughs> and so uh, I don't want to turn the light on, so I, I just kind of pop open my eyes. And what I see oftentimes is a way to guide me out. It's just the outline of the door, right? Is the hallway light might be on. It might be light coming in from the other side of the wall. And what does that light do? It outlines my exit, right? Just a little bit. I don't need a ton of light. And because my eyes are in the dark, I can see it. I can see my exit. Here's how I want you to look at your dark, your dark times. Don't look at your dark times as times that God's trying to hurt you. But your eyes can't see his light. You and I, we're going to lose our sight sometimes. We're going to lose our sensitivity. We can't see His light. So what He'll allow is for the room to go dark. But he's not doing it to hurt you. He's doing it so that your eyes can start to regain vision and, and recognize the light. Grace grows in dark places. This is a time for celebration. When we come together on Sunday and the music's great, we're uplifted by the inspiring messages of God's word. It's wonderful. But you know where I need grace? When I'm walking into work tomorrow, and I gotta deal with that knucklehead that's across the way. I gotta deal with that boss that thinks he's the center of the world. That's where I need grace. Because otherwise I'm gonna blow it. And as a boss, I gotta deal with all those employees that think they can do my job better than me. Everyone's looking for grace. 
grows in dark places. Don't be discouraged. God's got a plan. The other thing that it enables is maturity so that someone else's relationship with God becomes my own. So Hezekiah, Manasseh's daddy, was a good guy. Wonderful man. He did it right. He was honored by God. But was that going to be enough to sustain Manasseh? Manasseh had to decide on his own. Am I going or not? Is the God of my dad and my mom going to be my God or not? And some of us may like the luxury of just dragging, being dragged along in the wake of our parents or our grandparents and resting on what the previous generations have done. Let me tell you, you and I are going to come to these crisis points where you're going to have to decide, is God your God or not? In these dark times, this is where we get to really hone in on this idea, this, this question. And God's trying to get Manasseh in the right spot to go, listen, I was David's God and I was Solomon's God and I was your daddy's God. I'll be your God too. I'll make a way. I'll do it. If you trust me, if you give me your life, enable maturity. Finally, grace binds us to a new master. Grace binds us to a new master. Having grown up a missionary kid and hearing about all this stuff so many years, I was so disconnected from it. And I don't know how I was so close to it, but missing it. And this really hit, hit home in my life about four years ago. I was leading the music at a church. I was serving full-time vocationally in a church. And things started to just not work in my life. You ever had a season in your life where it just seems like no matter what you're trying to do, it just can't get this to, to, to work. And it just kept coming back and coming back. And pretty soon I realized that God was really serious about some things in my heart. There wasn't any you know, major outward sin that I could point to. I love my wife. I was honorable to her. I love my kids. But God was really, it felt like, just really upset. I didn't know what it was. And finally I realized that it was this. This message was born out of a, of a series of events that happened in our lives about four years ago when I started to realize that I was depending way more on man and on myself than on God. And so one day I was getting a sound check done and God had really started to hit me with these truths and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to fix it because that's the whole point. God's going to bring you these points where you're like, I don't know how to fix this. This is busted. It's beyond my pay grade. I can't, I can't make this work. And so I was getting a sound check on the Sunday morning and I saw my little boy. We got four kids, and one girl, three boys, and my second born boy was running across the back in the room just like this. And I was you know, we had the band up there, we were going through the slides, we were going through the work of, of just making sure everything was polished. And I was really speaking to him. And he said, you know, if if you're not gonna depend on me, it's just gonna be about how good you can do life. I'll take your kids and give them to someone else who'll do it better. I was horrified. He said, you know what? If, you're, if your marriage is going to be big, based around what you can do as a husband and how good of a husband you can be, if it's just going to be about you, I'll take your wife and I'll give her to another man. I can take it all, Jack, like that. I was floored. But he wasn't done. He said, I can take this ministry. If it's just about your talent, your ability, you try to do it and earn it and deserve it, and I'll take it and give it to someone else who can do it better. And the weight of that sat on me and it almost paralyzed me. I thought God was rejecting me as someone in the ministry. I thought he was leaving me out. I thought he had looked at me, and in a way he did. He rejected everything that I was holding on to to, to, to deserve my life. And he said, man, man, if it's not going to be about what I've done for you, and it's just about what you can do, you're always going to find people that are better than you. How do you figure that out? I never thought about that. Pretty soon, I realized I had to do a whole shift in my life. I had to stop looking at my wife like I deserved her. Stop looking at my kids like I deserved her. Stop looking at the gifts God had given me as though I had some kind of qualification for it. I 
mean, it's crazy when I say it out loud, but it was so deep inside, I didn't even know that was there. But every one of us are, are, are going to struggle with that. Whether you're either going to live in an attitude of grace or not. And what grace does is it binds us to a new master. Here's the challenge of grace. Everybody loves grace when you're talking about it in this wonderful way of like, oh, it's God's love. And what's the acronym? What's the acronym of grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. You ever heard that? God's riches at Christ's expense. I mean, that's a wonderful idea. The only problem with undeserved favor, the only problem with grace is that when you receive grace, you lose your rights. And boy, as Western Americans, we love to talk about rights. Don't we? We got a political season coming up. I don't know if you've heard. A little election going on out there. Everyone's trolling Facebook, throwing out their political views and all that stuff. And I, I've got friends who are passionate about it. They get into it. Because, and what I hear from all sides, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, libertarian, no one's going to take my rights. Right? I love our rights. I'm a, I'm a proud citizen of America. I love the fact that we have rights against authority and all that. But we're not talking about civil authority here. We're talking about the one who breathed life into you and me. And when we embrace grace, we exchange our what? Rights. God says, I'll give you grace, Manasseh, but you've got to give me who you are. And he says, it's you and me. I'll do your marriage for you. I'll fix it. I'll fix the, the kids and the grandkids. I'll take care of that. Throw that burden on me. But the only way I, I do this is if you give me the rights to who you are. There's an exchange that has to happen. That's what Nasa does. He gives his life to Jesus that day. He says, God, you're going to be my God. I'm not going to play my rights card anymore. I threw that away. Did Jesus have rights? Did he? Did he live thinking that he, he, he wasn't going to take it? I, when I look at Jesus, I see him going, God, I don't want to do this. But my love for you exceeds that. I'm comfort, and I'm going to give my life to you. And he gave away his life. He gave away his rights. And that's a hard message for us, I know. But it's the only way you can receive grace and get your second chance. you got to get off the throne of your life. And that's all that was, God was after in my life. I was sitting on the throne of my life, and I believed in God, but I was still in charge. And grace says, only works. Grace only works when you release the control of your life. And if you do that, watch out. It will change your whole life. And you'll start to experience this transformation inside you. This bubbling up of life that you don't have. I'm not a, I'm not a very big, happy morning person. That takes me, you don't want to talk to me before I have a cup of coffee. And ever since this change has happened in my life, my wife is like, you're actually decent to be around before 9 a.m. I can be around you. I can talk to you a little bit. And God will change you from the inside out. I'll change you from the inside out. I promise you. Finally, the impact of grace. I'm sorry we're going long. Pastor said I had an hour and a half. Is that true? <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. All right. We're almost done. Okay. The impact of grace. So what's the finishing story? How does this end up? Let's read it. After that, after this huge transformation, and God gets a second chance, but after we rebuilt the outside defensive wall of the city of David, he gets to work. He starts acting like a king. He says, to the west of the Gihon spring of the valley. It went from the fish gate and around the hill of Ophel. He also increased its height. He tightened up the defense system by posting army captains in all the fortress cities of Judah. He also did a good spring cleaning of the temple, carting out the pagan idols and the goddess statue. He took all the altars he'd set up on the temple hill and throughout Jerusalem and dumped them outside the city. He put the altar of God back in working order and restored worship, sacrificing peace offerings and thank offerings. This is awesome. Do you think Manasseh is doing all these things because he has to, because he's a king? What's changed? Is he doing half to kingship? Or is he doing get to kingship? I get to do. I get to be married to this person. 
right? And even if you don't have that attitude like that, let's just find something good in that person that you're married to and start talking about it. Man, I love the way you mow that lawn. Ladies, and just a few words will like make us climb the mountain for you. I promise. Hey guys, can you go and fix that leaky faucet that I haven't fixed that my wife's been telling me about for four weeks? It makes a difference. You start giving away the ownership of your life to the person around you, and God ejects this new attitude inside you that I get to do this. I get to raise my kids. I get to be a believer in Jesus. At this time, it's so exciting. God's doing so many things. And don't let these political clowns bring it down. If, if we're waiting for Washington to get right before we start living our life in faith in Jesus, good grief. It's never going to happen. Let's start giving it away now. Let's trust them now. What I want you to see is inward transformation has to precede outward action. Parents, don't try to change a kid's behavior. Let them wrestle with it a little bit. Well, I don't know, honey. I'm not going to tell you no, you can't go to that party. What do you want to do? Now, I'm not saying you should be foolish with them, but let them reveal where they're at. If you stop them from making poor choices their whole life, you're never going to see what's in their heart. And the moment they're out from your authority, what are they going to do? They're in the world. They've been in the world for years. Their outward life just hadn't been allowed to catch up to them. God is willing to let us make mistakes. I'm not advising us to be foolish. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But I want you to understand, we got to change this. You get a young person fired up and passionate about Jesus, oh my word, they'll change their high school. They'll change, they'll, they'll move mountains. Young people have the capacity to do that. We're too old. We can't do it. But they have the energy. Let's, let's focus on the heart. Let's focus on changing them inwardly. The second thing, God marries our worst with his best perfectly. I love this about God. All my regrets, all my mistakes, guess what he does to it? He doesn't just erase it, he gives purpose to it. See, I can talk about grace now, and I never could before. I can tell you intellectually what it was, but I experienced it. And that made all the difference. And too many believers are, are strong in the head and talking about grace. But they have felt it. Right? You remember what it was like to be uh, courting that, that woman you ended up marrying? Young guys, men, older gentlemen. You remember what happened when uh, uh, you picked her up and you walked into that door and you saw her come out of the room and you saw her come down those stairs and she was wearing that. It was summertime and her skin was brown and she was wearing that sundress and you were like, Sweet Jesus, thank you. It was just, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And now, fast forward 30 years, and, uh... <laughs> okay, so you went, like I say, all of a sudden, it's like you've woken up with this desire to find and reveal to your spouse what they do to annoy you in your marriage. I wish you wouldn't put your feet up like that. Man, I wish you wouldn't cook the food like that. Man, I wish you just pepper, 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 pepper. Right? And we start to just live life because we're living and we have no choice. Let me tell you something, that's not living. It's not abundant living. God will marry our worst. Go back to those days of when you were in love. I'm not saying that you can stay there because I go crazy. If I, if I was in that heightened emotional state all the time, I wouldn't be able to function. I, I'm serious. I'm serious. When, I, when I fell in love with Molly, I was an idiot. I was a bastard. Okay? So love changes and it grows and matures. But let's not, let's not compromise by saying that we shouldn't. We shouldn't try to feel that again in our heart, deep down inside. God marries our worship with his best purpose. Here's the point. If you all and I will allow God to have control of our life, all the regret, all the mistakes, God will breathe life back into that. You don't have to be dragged down. Your best days don't have to be what used to be. The future is bright for you with God. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it means it can be filled with purpose and meaning. God marries our worst with his best. 
Grace isn't the end of good works, but the beginning. Find the final uh, sub point here. Grace isn't the end of good works, but the beginning. God's unmerited favor. Every other religion will tell you what? You have to do this to what? Get that. Right? You have to be a good person. You have to pray five times. You have to this. You have to blow yourself up in order to get this. Crazy. And as because we're in control of our lives, we kind of like that because we get to stay as the authority. But Grace says, listen, because you've been given this, now I have something for you to do with your life. This purpose is totally the opposite. And you'll never find that in any other faith. Grace gets planted inside you, and all of a sudden your life starts to take a different turn that you couldn't even anticipate taking. It bubbles up and goes out. It's the beginning of good works. We don't do good to get grace, right? That's my point. You never do good to get it. You do good because you've received it already. And your life's been changed more. So the conclusion today, are you and I surrendered to grace? And what's grace? And what kind of favor? And what's the key of that phrase? It's the adjective, undeserved. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to deserve it. Stop trying to measure up to it. Let it be something that you just kind of, you, you know, as believers, there should be these moments where we just kind of start to weep. Not because we're emotionally unstable, but because we're just considering what God's done for us. And I'm afraid we're losing that. We have the privilege of traveling all these churches, and I see that in the faces and dispositions of the people. They've forgotten why. They've lost their why. And the why is what Jesus has done. And it doesn't just happen when you ask Jesus in your heart. That's a continuing thing. You can comb the depths of grace the rest of your life and never reach the bottom. It changes your whole perspective. So what does this look like? Everyone take your, your hands if you would, please. Clench them as tight as you can. Tight as you can. Tighter. This is how many believers are trying to live their life. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to love Jesus, but I'm also going to have my rights. And we're clinching. And we're holding on. And we're trying to find a way to still be in control. And as a result, we can't receive anything from God. Alright. Are they okay? And now this is grace. Right? Yeah, come up. This is grace. God, I don't deserve your life. I don't deserve what you've done for me. I couldn't possibly earn it. But you want to give it to me. You want to give me that freedom in my marriage. You want to give me that joy in my heart. And you'll fill me with your life. If I'll just open up my hands and I'll let you have control. Open up my life. My challenge to Oakwood challenge to me is to stop living like you're going to grit your way through life. Open it up and trust Him. And let the life of Jesus rush in through you as you give your life away to Him. Let's close in prayer again. Jesus, I, I thank you so much for everyone's attention and Lord, the willingness to, to hear from your Spirit. God, help us. Lord, you... We've seen people give their whole life to you. And we know that it wasn't because they had to. We know that they did that because they wanted to give it to you. God, give us that kind of love for you. Help us to experience the unmerited favor that you had for us. And breathe it into us, Jesus. I pray that the Holy Spirit would, would rush into our lives. And give us the strength to not live so difficult, uh, in such a difficult way. God, break through our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.